Hello, I'm Sivam Krish. Today is a windy day here in Adelaide and you might hear some branches dropping on the roof. We are going to discuss about the design process and the way it relates to generative design in terms of design space that we discussed previously. Let's look at the design process. Let's look at the three elements that we do use for design. We use our brain, we use pencil and paper, and of course, we use computers. All three of them are amazing tools. Let's start with the brain. The brain is made of stuff that has a consistency of yogurt, 1.5 liters of it. That is why you should not shake it too much. It has amazing learning and thinking and processing abilities. The amazing thing about it is that it can think about itself. I think something thinking about itself is mind-blowing. It can contemplate the mysteries of the universe. It can also teach itself and all it requires is about 25 watts of power. The human brain is an amazing piece of design in itself. It's a product of biological generative design process. It's made out of many specialized areas specializing in certain capabilities. Overall, it's made of neurons which are connected to each other. As we grow, these connections are either reinforced or they, they disappear. We all born with more connections that we have now. So please, use your brain. Because if you don't, you lose those connections. The connections that are used are reinforced and those that are not fade away. The way this happens is also highly evolved. The brain is amazingly more sophisticated than a computer, which is pathetic in comparison. Now, for the pencil and paper. This is an outstanding combination in itself. It's great for quickly exploring early stage concepts. You can do things with it that you cannot do with a computer. It stimulates your brain, gives you ideas and directions to think along. It's a valuable tool in the design process and should be used more than it is used now. Let's not talk about it. It's a waste of time. But it's evolving fast, trying to catch up with the human brain, which of course is designed using generative design, and the computer is not. Naturally, it ain't that good. You have to instruct it all the time. But because it doesn't have a brain, it does exactly what it's told. Now, there's some merit to that, especially if you know exactly what you want or for doing stuff that you don't want to do yourself. Unfortunately, computers got involved with design in an odd way, mainly because designers are very conservative, that's my opinion, and not very creative in the way they use tools. They may be creative in their work, but in the way they work, they remain conservative. They are very reluctant to replace what they are familiar with, something that they are unfamiliar with. Despite its ability to do things in much better ways, computers were initially and to a large extent still used to do things in ways that we are used to doing things previously. The story of CAD illustrates this well. Only recently, designers have come to accept that with computers, you can do things differently. You can do things better. It took a long time for designers to realize that design is fundamentally about information modeling. As you can see from this graph of BIM jobs, its wide adaptation started around 2005. What happened before then? Not many seem to have known about it. Perhaps it was a bit like generative design. 
BIM actually started in 1986 with ArchiCare. It was called Virtual Building Solutions, which is a term that I like because that is what it is. AutoCAD automated the drawing board after the PC explosion in 1980s. But selling CAD was not easy then. Draftspersons were very resistant to it and naturally you don't see them anymore hunched in front of their favorite drawing boards. Okay, ArchiCAD took the right approach. They realized much earlier on that what designers were creating are not drawings but information models. But it was not a sexy concept then and no one went gaga over it. They did not see the value of it as many do not see the value of generative design. The lesson learned here is that when important changes happen people do not take notice. Not only people, even companies do not. Autodesk did not. It took them more than a decade for its value to be observed. So in 2002, Autodesk acquired Revit Technology Corporation at an expense over $100 million, only after its value was obvious to practicing architects. Of course, they could not call it virtual building technology. That name was taken by Archicad. So I hope this explains why you see this very sudden growth that you see here. This is the employment stat for BIM experts. So why did it shoot up like this? It's mainly because things were done the wrong way for the past 25 years. But this is the typical adoption pattern. It's called the S-curve. I hope you can see it here. It starts with a very few people, picks up huge momentum and then declines. I guess you can see the declining bit here. So I've also plotted generative design and as you can see we are at the very early stages here. BIM is about the marriage of database to 3D graphics. It's a late life marriage. Nothing to get excited about because everybody knows that these two have been around for quite some time together. But it's not only but it's not very exciting because these guys are not going to produce interesting babies or bring about new possibilities. But the wedding can be grand. They can hire out a limo and call in the press. But it's fundamentally a belated, boring affair. It's about consolidating the obvious. Now let's go on to the exciting stuff. That happens in early stage design. As you can see, when you design something, uncertainty decreases and certainty increases. Pencil and paper are useful in this early stage. Okay. CAD is used once the design has settled in the middle stage. And analysis tools are used when there's a clear representation of the design. This is when the engineers can start calculating. This is how things work now. So for us to get a realistic evaluation of design, to see how it feels, how much it costs, and how it performs, we need to get to this stage. So as you can see, most of the major commitments are made in the early stages of design. So this is where improvements can be made. But we cannot measure or evaluate the goodness of our design propositions before they mature. We cannot analyze these designs. To analyze these designs, you need to be here, close to the final stage. CAD industry is now fighting for turf in the early stages of design. But if you want to sell CAD, you got to tell your customers how it can save them time and money. So any form of proper data structuring or the use of programs to create designs can help you. And all that is good and it's happening now. We don't have to worry about that. The combination of modeling, simulations and performance evaluation is about taking design from high levels of uncertainty to high levels of certainty. 
The only way to do this is to use programs that will take this from early stage design to final stages as efficiently as possible. As I've pointed out, you need to get to the mature stage to be able to evaluate the performance of your design. So let's see how this is done in a normal design process. But before we do that, let's bring in the concept of performance space that we discussed before. So we see each design proposition as a dot or a star. So the design process is now about moving from uncertainty to certainty. Now to establish certainty, the designs need to be at a high level of development. In the manual design process, this follows a zigzag route. Now, this is not to say that it is inefficient. Only engineers tend to think that if you go along a windy path, it's less efficient than going along a highway. What they forget, of course, is the whole process of travel is to see what's out there. So the design process requires traveling in design space, considering many possibilities, discarding many, and combining the good aspects of what you have considered based on what you have learned along the way. But it's fundamentally about traveling in design space. So let's get back to design space. What generative design does is that lets you explore a much larger design space or in other words use a single genetic model that represents a much larger design space. This is how exploration will look like in design space growing from low levels of certainty to high levels of certainty. You can see that compared to this, it covers a much larger design space. Design is about the exploration of design space. This lecture comes to you from the lost continent, from the city of Adelaide. Thank you for watching. Hope you now have a better idea of design as an exploration of the design space.